Hi, welcome everyone to another Port Jackson Securities webinar. Uh, my name is Jonah, I'm the host for today. And uh, today we're joined with Stephen from Prescient. How are you going, Stephen? Very well, how are you? Very good, yeah, doing well. Um, now, just before we start the webinar, this is for information purposes only, of course. Um, don't take it for any sort of advice. And uh, as well, I encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. There's a box there as well. Um, so at any time you have one, just send it over and, and there'll be some time at the end to get them answered. Um, so just quickly passing it over to Stephen, take it away. Okay, thank you everyone for your time today to learn about Prescient. I understand that many of you, if not most of you, are new to the story. I'll walk through, it should be about, um, about 40 odd minutes, 45 minutes, and I'm gonna speak about the three different pillars of the business. But basically, uh, the, the take home message here is per this slide, uh, in the sort of a market, it's not just about building long term value, super important, but there are a lot of short term catalysts that really drive uh, a tremendous amount of shareholder value. So I'll just walk you through. Uh, to introduce the company through its investment highlights, we have a very simple business model at Prescient. We find the best technologies we can, uh, we license from the best and we work with the best. And I should have said it from the upfront because most people have to assume that there's no prior knowledge. We develop oncology drugs where there are poorly met needs. So there's lots of oncology drugs out there. Some of them work okay. Some of them don't work very well at all. Um, and what we're going is the areas of unmet need and having real you know, fantastic medicine. So we work with the best cancer institutes in the world, license their technology and continue to work with them as we develop them. We've got a very comfortable cash runway. We've got over 20 mil cash um, with some more options being exercised uh, you know, during the course of March, uh, which will um, you know, bolster that even further. So very important in this market to have your catalysts fully funded and we certainly are. Lots of shots on goal and a diversified pipeline. It includes two targeted therapies. I'll introduce those in a minute, but basically we've got, you know, the rubber hits the road with human clinical trials and in our human clinical trials, we're showing a lot of potential here in areas of poorly met need. Uh, and we have what is called orphan drug status designated to us by the US FDA. And I'll explain what that means too and why that's so valuable to us. We have two cell therapy platforms. As the name suggests, cell therapies are using living cells as a medicine. This is for you know, an emerging field and we certainly have uh, an amazing position, a shovels to the gold rush type of position in that field. So again, some near term catalysts and some you know, longer term emerging catalysts as well and lots of news flow. So again, uh, the three pillars of the business as I alluded to, we've got this diversified portfolio of later stage assets. They're our targeted therapies and our emerging assets. Our targeted therapies target things inside the cancer cell that make it go wrong and uh, the cell therapies target things on the outside of the cancer cell. So our targeted therapies, we have uh, notably PTX100, a phase 1B drug that has potential to leap deep into clinical development with really encouraging activity in uh, a group of blood cancers that have a very poorly met need. We also have Cell Prime, which is a cell therapy platform that enhances existing cell therapies and that is ready for the clinic right now. And we have Omnicar, um, an earlier stage platform technology that is treating a living cells like a plug and play approach. Amazing technology we've got from the people who invented this uh, area of cell therapy, University of Pennsylvania, that has the potential to change the world. So um, looking forward to describing all of these with you during the course of this presentation. This is a different way to um, you know, present those different um, assets we have in this pipeline. The take home message here is that this is a pipeline of a company much bigger than ourselves. It's diversified, it's built in risk and lots of value creation built into this over a staggered pipeline. Diversified not only by the types of cancers, but how these cancers are treated and the stage of development. I'm gonna start with PTX100. These are targeted therapies. Again, these are small molecules that get inside the cancer cell and target problematic proteins inside the cancer cell and switch the cancer cell off and, and kill it. And this was licensed from, is licensed from Yale University and co-invented by our scientific founder, Saeed Sebti. So there's a problematic protein um, that drives a great many cancers. It's called RAS. The bottom line is um, 
grass has been, it, we know it's super important, but until recently, very, very difficult to inhibit. There's actually nowhere for these drugs to bind and maybe just one binding pocket, but that's not nearly enough. So what we take a very unique approach. If you can't inhib inhibit the parent, inhibit the children. So we switch this pathway off downstream and those molecules there, ROVAC and RAL. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit about the diseases that we're targeting. There's a, gl a group of lymphoma, uh, you know, blood diseases called lymphomas, T cell lymphomas. These are your white blood cells that are normally used to fight infection, um, but sometimes they become cancerous themselves. And there's, you know, these are not common diseases in peripheral T cell lymphoma. This is circulating in the blood. Um, you know, there's only about 7,000 patients a year in the US, but which doesn't seem like many, as in new cases. Um, but you can see that, you know, these um, in this area of unmet need, the uh, the potential, the pricing potential, there's a drug called Folatin, which would be a direct competitor to PGX100. It doesn't work particularly well. It only works in, you know, somewhat in about 27% of patients. And even then only for a, a few months, three months or so. And that's priced at about $500,000 dollars per patient per year. So that shows that even though it's a not a large market by patient numbers because it's an unmet need, it is still a, a lucrative market from a, a commercial perspective. And the other type of lymphoma we look at is cutanea. So this is this it's a related disease, but this presents on the skin and is quite debilitating. It's not as frequent as peripheral T cell lymphoma, but again, the things they have in common, there's very few tools in the shed. And once the patient becomes resistant and the disease progresses and these therapies no longer work, there are precious little options for these patients. And that's where we come in. That's where PTX100 comes in, into that area of unmet need. So in summary, this is a clinical trial being led by Australia's most renowned haematologist, blood cancer specialist, Professor uh, Miles Prince. We're very lucky to have a world, um, world leading clinician in Australia in this field, and he's certainly internationally recognised. We've seen really, really encouraging signals, and I'll walk you through those. They include two complete responses, so two complete eradications of disease. And of the 10 available patients we've had so far, seven of them have had a duration of response for much longer than we would expect with the standard of care. So it's not just how many patients respond, it's how long they respond for. And the picture tells a thousand words, I'll show you some um, that presented graphically for you. And we've just been recently granted um, orphan drug designation in, um, in the US by the US FDA for all T cell lymphomas. So once again, what you would normally expect in terms of how many patients would typically respond in this disease setting, you're normally looking at about 30% and we've seen 40% so far. So that's that's quite encouraging from these initial small numbers. But it, then you have to look at how long do these patients typically respond for? And remember that half a million drug I showed you earlier, 27% of them, close enough to 30 in that case, and they only responded for about three months. So we're targeting five to six months. We think that would be a significant improvement over three. But beyond that, we're, we're nudging nine months now. So we're blowing three months out of the water on the numbers we've got so far. So that's really, really encouraging. But to present this graphically, this is called a swimmer's plot. It's like looking at a swimming pool, you know, swimming lane from, from, uh, from above. You can see how long these responses go for. But I'll, I'll just ask you to focus on that red dotted line. That's the standard of care. So that's what you would expect from patients right now. Um, from you know, using current medicines is about three months. And we're trying to beat that with that green line and we're even beating the green line. Um, so it is looking really, really encouraging. Just as a case study here, you can see um, you know, one particular patient with CTCL had a very, um, you know, very quick, very strong response. You can see this is a, a measure of her cancer. She'd failed five prior therapies. So imagine trying a cancer drug, having it fail, trying another one, having that fail. So to do that five times, this is a patient for whom nothing was really expected other than maybe testing some safety. And bang, we see her tumor just, um, her cancer's just 
uh, all but disappear very, very quickly. And again, it just is before and after shots. These are pictures of her. These are the, um, the, the cancer lesions on her skin before and after. And when I mean after, this is a, a few months into therapy. This patient is ongoing before and after, before and after and before and after. So this patient has had you know, a, quite a miraculous response. Quality of life is amazing. Uh, and this patient is ongoing. So that's just uh, an example of what we're seeing. So next steps, where to from here? Um, these patients are staying on therapy a lot longer than we expected, which is fantastic. It's drawing out the trial. Normally you'd finish a trial at the end of phase one and go to the FDA and do your next step forward. We're actually gonna bolster this with more patients, you know, seven odd more patients, not a great deal many. Uh, more, but what we're going to do is take a more robust data package to the US FDA to then plan our phase two study. Uh, we're doing a, a new manufacturing run of drug for, to, um, to enable that study. And we'll also be discussing with the FDA the potential to make that phase two study what's called an accelerated approval study, which is the shortest path to get a drug to market. Uh, and I'd ask anyone on this call to um, try to identify how many Australian companies have taken a cancer drug all the way through to an approval. So this is a big deal. This would be, if we can get this, the biggest catalyst in the company's history and, and a significant catalyst in, in the Australian biotech sector's history as well. In addition to that, we've got, it's very, very safe. What you're seeing here is the current used drugs in this disease and how frequently you get really bad side effects. Side effects so bad you need to go to hospital. It's called grade three or above. And you can see here that between 25 and 85% of the time, patients get so sick from the therapy, they've got to go to hospital. So it's quite cruel that um, you know, what you're trying to treat patients with currently is actually uh, making them uh, just as sick and sending them to hospital. But by contrast, we've not seen any adverse events related to this drug. So a very, very clean safety profile, super important in this fragile patient population and enables us to contemplate combining drugs quite safely if we need to down the track. So this is just a regulatory summary about where we're at now. We obtained what's called um, orphan drug status for all T cell lymphomas a couple of weeks ago from the US FDA. Why that is uh, significant is that we only actually requested one type of T cell lymphoma and the FDA, for some unknown reason, actually said, we're going to give you that, but we're going to give you even more. We're going to give you all T cell lymphomas, which we did not ask for. So you can hazard a guess as to, I'm not going to speculate as to why they did that, but what I don't need to speculate is that it is very good for prescient. So um, very good to have that. And I'll explain what's important about that in a moment. So the advantages of orphan drugs, why the big deal, what's, what's it even mean? Well, the biggest one, you get seven years of guaranteed market exclusivity in the US upon approval of your drug. Imagine any other aspect of business, we can go into the world's biggest market and the regulator promises you that no one can copy what you're doing for seven years. That's what Prescience just received for more than what we asked for, for all of T-cell lymphomas. They enjoy higher drug prices, because they're areas of unmet need and the sales are much more resilient to cycles. Even in, you know, pharma's relatively stable, but it's not, you know, it's not immune to, um, you know, to economic cycles. There's a little bit of um, response there, but orphan drugs always outperform. In fact, um, even though um, drug, uh, drug prices and sales continue to march upwards, it's almost twice the rate. Orphan drugs grow at almost twice the rate. So, higher prices, more stable, quicker growth, and in fact, is going to exceed 300 billion in a few years time. So these are the advantages of orphan drugs. This is why they are highly sought after, uh, is that despite these cycles, orphan drugs always outperform. And that's what we've got now with PTX100 from the US FDA. Also talk about this, that what is important about an accelerated approval pathway with regular drug development. Some of you might know here, you get your basic research and then you do your preclinical work, usually in mice. And then you get into your clinical trials, which we're in, and it's normally phase one, phase two, which is a bigger trial. And phase three is normally a trial so big that Australian companies can't even afford to do them. Hundreds of patients, 
five to seven years, hundreds of millions of dollars. And at the end of that, you go to the FDA and hope to get a marketing authorization permission to you know, hopefully get an approval and you can start selling the drug. That's the normal drug development process. With accelerated approvals, which is what we'll be seeking, it truncates that right down. Instead of a phase one, phase two, phase three, it brings it all the way down to a phase one and then a, um, a definitive study that uh, will get you onto the market. And then once you're on the market, you can you need to do confirmatory studies, but you're selling the drug by then. And as a result, this saves years and years. And it's not just years, it's, it's years, risk, and countless dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars saved. It also means that instead of having to sell the farm and get someone else to do the trial and companies be left with the scraps from the table, it means that you can actually take that trial yourself all the way through and retain all of that value, which is super important. So once again, I don't believe there's an ASX company that has accelerated approval and wouldn't it be um, fantastic for Prescient to get that. So stay tuned for that. PGX200 is a different drug. Uh, it's targeting a different problematic protein in, in the body. Uh, this also has orphan drug designation. It's in another type of blood cancer called acute myeloid leukemia. It's a nasty cancer. Patients normally in this relapse setting die within you know, about six months from, um, from relapse. And what we've had on this trial so far, this has been conducted in the US, four patients with complete eradication of disease and another one with a partial eradication. So that's fantastic. And this trial is due to read out um, later this year. Under the leadership of um, Jeff Lancet too, he's the first guy to get a drug approved in this disease in 40 years. And this was the next trial that he took on, which is a fantastic coup for prescient. So I've just described two drugs that normally companies are just built around just that and um, you'd be satisfied with that. But um, there's certainly lots more at prescient and I'll go into these different pillars now. So let's start talking about cell therapies. PGX 100 and 200, that's the here and now. The emerging field is this incredible field called cell therapy, as, a, as the name suggests, using living cells as a medicine. It is revolutionizing the way we treat medicine. Um, the word revolutionize is bandied about and cheapened a lot, but believe me when I say that um, this is a genuine revolution in how human disease is treated, uh, as evidenced by uh, quite famously Emily Whitehead here, aged six, she had a type of blood cancer um, called ALL. She tried chemo once, tried chemo twice, and uh, and didn't work. And when this photo was being taken, it was actually 24 hours from her organs shutting down. When in the last ditch attempt to save their daughter, they um, her parents, uh, Emily's parents, enrolled her onto what's called a, a cell therapy trial called CAR T. She was the first pediatric patient to receive the therapy, and this was Emily at May last year. So it has been responses like this durable long-term remissions that are emboldening conservative clinicians to use the word cure. 10 year durable remissions in patients who would normally not respond if it looks like a cure and smells like a cure. And this is just the beginning. Um, so this is a field that's absolutely booming from a standstill. Now we've got these 10 year durable remissions. It's growing you know, within six years from now, within five years from now, it's actually going to, you know, from a standing start, going to hit 37 billion and beyond. But like any brand new technology, the first iteration is the clunkiest, right? Which is great for patients. If this is as bad as it's going to get and it's already curing patients. But think of the first mobile phone, the Gordon Gecko brick. Think of the very first personal computer you ever used and look how far we've come with that. So it's the same thing here. Cell therapy, it's just the start. I've just listed here some of the challenges that need to be overcome in cell therapy to bring this to more patients, about making them safer, more controllable, more efficient, and uh, especially in, in, um, in, in to other types of cancers as well. Um, and basically we've got two platforms here, Omnicar and Cell Prime, which I'll introduce you to, which don't address one of them, it addresses all of them. And where they overlap, it does so in a very complementary manner. So again, what we're doing, like you're taking a, that first Gordon Gecko mobile phone and we're bringing basically the brand new iPhone to, um, to, to the table. 
or even the iOS to enable lots of different phones to be made. Is, so basically making the whole field safer, more effective and sustainable. And we're really well positioned here. Um, before I go into the assets, you wanna know how these fit into the landscape. So at the moment, there's actually cell, there's seven drugs approved in cell therapy now. So it's not just science fiction, they're approved. I think four of them are approved here in Australia and are subsidized by the government, by the PBS equivalent to cell therapies. At the moment, you use the patient's own cells. There's a couple of targets and indications and ways of making them. And that's um, these are the companies with drugs on the market now. Hundreds of Australians have been treated with this, thousands across the world, um, billion dollar market opportunity already. But that is just the tip of the iceberg and there's different cells, different targets, hundreds of different targets, different types of cancer and different ways of making them. Our technologies can address not only the current ones, but the emerging ones as well. So all of these, you know, we're not backing one horse here. We're not trying to convince you that one type of approach is the winner. We can actually assist all of them. So again, in, in the biggest market, well, healthcare is probably the most robust, robust um, place to be in times of economic turmoil, but the biggest market in healthcare is certainly oncology. The fastest growing area of oncology is without doubt cell therapy and the standing start to 37 billion by 2028. And I'd, I'd be looking, so in the biggest market, in the fastest growing area, who has the four, who was at the forefront of that area? And without a doubt, it's going to be that company that has next generation platforms that can enhance um, what people already have. They're scalable and controllable. And it helps if they actually come from the very place that invented the whole field. And pleasingly, when you take that top down approach, that's us, that's exactly describes us and where we're at, perfectly positioned. Um, and our business model, you're probably wondering what our business model is. So we're developing our own assets there in green using both of our platforms. But beyond that, we can you know, license one or more technologies to external partners. And so we've got this nice um, leverage of our assets, um, providing shareholders with opportunity off our balance sheet uh, and creating a lot of leverage and diversifying risk. So we've got these shovels to the, to the gold rush position, which is very unique. Let me describe the first one of these, Omnicar. This is the plug and play one, treating these cells like a Lego set. This is licensed from Penn and Oxford. Penn invented the field of CAR-T. Prescient was the first company since Novartis to license a CAR-T technology from Penn. So we're very, very proud of that. And it basically, um, again, treats them like a Lego set. You've got the cell and then you've got the part that binds to the cancer and it decouples them with a little bit of you know, Velcro, molecular Velcro called spy tape and spy catcher. So it separates that, these two bits of Velcro come together and you get a fully armed CAR T cell. So it basically means it's a genuine platform. We can use any targeting ligand, we can use any part that binds to any part of the cancer cell and we can use any immune cell a T cell, other immune cells, NK cells and macrophages. And they can even be off the shelf cells as well. So without giving too much of a science lesson, Omnicar can do what other conventional CAR-T can't. So if you think of conventional CAR-Ts, the ones that cured Emily Whitehead, think of it as a soldier in the immune system fighting the cancer, but it's a soldier that only has one map, only one weapon, can only hit one target. You can't redirect this soldier and most disturbingly, you can't control or even communicate with a soldier in the field once you've deployed this soldier. So by contrast, Omnicar is a soldier that you can arm with any weapon, including multiple weapons at once, that we can give any map for multiple deployments. We have can direct against any target, including several targets at the same time. Very importantly, full communication and control at all times, even the ignition, and can even send images back in real time. So if you take nothing away from um, you know, this presentation except for this slide, just remember this is that as wonderful and revolutionary as CAR-T is, that's that on the left. And what we are doing is really um, taking the game to the next level on the right there, not just for us, but for any other player as well. It can do these other features. We can increase, you know, increase the, the activity you know, post infusion. We can switch it on, switch it off, switch it on again, like a remote control. We can direct it from one target to another and even plug and play multiple things. So there's nowhere for the cancer to hide. 
and this is just, um, I won't bore you with too much data, but some of the science nerds lean into this and get very excited because it's the world's first experiment in any system showing that you can redirect a cell from one target to another. So in this case, it's leaving the the green cells alone, but smashing the, the red cells, these are, these are brain cancer cells, until you add the binder for the green cells and then um, quite obediently, it stops killing the red ones and starts smashing the green ones. So that's never been done before to be able to redirect a, um, a cell therapy product without any new cells, just adding that binder component, that Lego component and being able to redirect one cell uh, one cell product from one type of cancer to a different type of cancer on the fly, like a remote control. And where are we going with this? Well, we all know what Apple did, um, creating a cohesive ecosystem for um, you know, for their you know, online services and, and, and products, and hasn't been done in medicine yet. And we think Omnicar could be that uh, one to pull together these different modalities. So we see a world in the not too distant future where cancer patient gets their cancer biopsied and characterized and says, okay, this is the different um, profile of your cancer. This happens already. It's routine now in every hospital in, in the Western world. But then the doctor will be able to say, based on this, I need binders A, B, and D. And you take those tagged binders and plug them onto an Omnicar cell. And the patient is getting a bespoke therapy tailored to their cancer. Uh, and you know, we're creating the first apps in the app store, we're doing the first cells and the binders. What makes this a cohesive ecosystem? Is anyone out there making another binder, an antibody, or another cell type, we can tag it and put it into our app store. So instead of these different companies competing with one another, we can bring them in and they can actually work together for the first time. So like third party apps in the app store. So. That's exciting. So we're on a drug development trajectory anyway. That's that's what it is. But this app store will naturally build out and will um, accommodate other players as well in a very, very exciting manner. The last pillar of the business, which is no less exciting, is a cell therapy enhancement technology called Cell Prime. So again, just the CAR-T process, I should have maybe started with this. So what is this CAR-T that has cured people like Emily Whitehead, it's a, way of it's a way of weaponizing your own immune cells. So blood's collected from the cancer patient and these cells, uh, you know, these T cells, which fight infection normally, but don't recognize cancer, they're isolated from the blood. And step three, they're genetically programmed outside of the body in a lab to now have a receptor that can recognize the cancer. That's called a CAR T cell. So these, this is now your own immune cell that is now capable of latching onto and killing cancer. Then step four, millions of these are grown up and it's given back to the patient. So they're getting an enhanced version of their own natural immune cells that now know where to look to, to hunt down and kill the cancer instead of a viral infected cell. So what Cell Prime does, you drop it into here, Cell Prime M, M for manufacturing. When you drop it into that part, it makes a better type of cell. And cell prime A, which is A is for adjuvant, which is given alongside the CAR T therapy is administered to the patient. It could be in one or the other, ideally both. So cell prime M, it basically produces a more youthful type of cell. It's ready for the clinic right now. Um, and cell prime A, um, again, I'll go into this a little bit more, but it, it really cracks through this force field that tumors present around themselves. So this is just a, a snapshot. Um, and we invented this um, in-house at Prescient, which we're very, very proud of. This isn't licensed from anyone. We've developed in collaboration with the Peter McCallum Cancer Center here in Melbourne, a world leading cancer research institute. We have a very close working relationship with them. But Prescient owns all of the intellectual property. So cell prime M, uh, once again, this makes a more youthful type of cell. I don't want to give a science lesson here, but basically in your body, you have these naive T cells and they differentiate and they mature and evolve. It's like Pokemon, as my daughter has informed me, Pokemon evolve, or so do these T cells, and they have different characteristics along the way. So right there at the start, they last a very long time, but they do no killing. And when they're fully evolved, right at the other end of these effector cells, they do tons of killing, but they die before the job is finished. So 
That's the problem is that they are good at killing, but they, they don't hang around long enough. And the problem is current CAR T therapies, when you get that bag of cells that you give to a patient, there are far too many of these. They chew through the cancer and then die before the job's finished. And what we know now is that those patients who happen to have miraculous so-called responses, their bags of cells through one way or another, they just happen to have in that soup of cells, many more of these central memory cells, which kill but last longer. Why am I telling you this? Because when you add cell prime into the manufacturing process, it pushes them to this type of desirable, youthful type of cell. So it takes the guesswork out of it, the luck, the green thumb component out of it, and hopefully give all of these patients a chance to have these very, very strong responses, not just those lucky few who happen to get a favorable soup of cells. In fact, we have 50% more of these cells, it's just data, and when you do nothing else to the cell except for make it, you know, add, add our secret source into the manufacturing process, it doubles the performance of the CAR T cell. So it doubles it by doing nothing else but dropping it in. So that's very exciting, a very low interventional way of accommodating, um, you know, of improving third party processes. And we're speaking to various groups on doing that. Cell prime A is when it's given to the patient. Now, what we have to understand in solid tumors, there's something called the T in it, a tumor microenvironment. Tumors, uh, they're really cunning beasts. They create these force fields around it to keep the immune system out and to make sure it's got a, an environment that's um, very hostile for the immune system, but really um, nurtures the cancer cell growth and helps it grow and spread. So it's really nasty. The challenge for all cancer therapies, how do we crack open that force field so the immune cells can get in and kill the cancer? And this is what cell prime A does. It cracks open that force field, but that's not all it does. Um, it improves survival. It reduces some of these extinguishing things by two thirds. It can dramatically increase CAR T expansion within the host. In fact, up to ninefold more when you add it with cell prime. And it can, again, crack open that TME and get these tumors to where they need to get to. Um, and here we can see again, just more data showing that, you know, the in very, very resistant models where CAR Ts do nothing, you add cell prime A, you get a much bigger benefit when you add it cell prime A and M, you get almost complete eradication of disease. In fact, there was only one mouse that had any detectable tumor at all in these highly aggressive resistant models. Um, so again, up to nine fold more expansion. So, this is how many cells inside the body can proliferate. When you add cell prime A alone, it's really good. But when you add cell prime A with cells manufactured with cell prime M, ninefold more, are you kidding me? 900% more cells. Imagine fighting a war with 900% more soldiers, not 10% more, that's what this does. So um, we expect this to make a big difference to existing therapies. Um, and how many actually get to where they're needed, so they're proliferating like crazy, how many crack through that force field and get into the tumour? Well, basically, helper cells 300% more and the actual ones that do the actual killing, 400% more um, get to where they're needed. So again, imagine a war zone where there's a hot spot and you've got four times as many soldiers um, going there as you otherwise would. That is a very, very good thing. And I know you've been introduced to a lot here. It's probably a bit of a head spin. How do these therapies <laughs> fit with one another in cell therapy? So as a reminder, Omnicar is the plug and play. That's the modularity. So it's about redirection and multi-arming and a plug and play approach. It's agnostic on the type of cell. It's agnostic on the target. It can work with anything with that modularity. Whereas cell prime M actually focuses on the cell itself. It's a more youthful, more effective, more persistent type of cell. And if it can work with current generation, uh, next generation cells, it can actually work with current generation um, cell therapies too. And cell prime A can work with all of them by cracking open that tumor microenvironment and boosting the number of cells that then proliferate through the body. So that is that. So in summary, we've covered a lot of ground here. We've probably got three companies worth of technologies here. So thanks for your, um, your 
attention, but there's lots of catalysts this year, PGX100 in T cell lymphomas. I showed you that exciting data. We're extending that, hoping to see a continuation on trend. If we see anything, if it holds trend even remotely, it is looking very exciting for a phase two trial there, which we hope uh, could be an accelerated approval trial, could be a massive catalyst for not only the company, but the whole sector. Um, and our two wonderful platforms with ongoing development and hope, hopefully leveraging those with third parties, that's this year alone. So lots of overlapping news as these assets unfold. So yeah, these are the three pillars of the business. Again, PGX100 in these areas of unmet need can leap deep into clinical development. FDA has given us more than we asked for in our orphan drug designation. I've never heard of that. Omnicar is the future, um, you know, really taking cell therapies to the next level. Think of that soldier analogy. And Cell Prime, which is the here and now, really practical, low interventional way of enhancing cell therapies, making them more youthful, more last longer, kill better, and crack through that force field. But not just our therapies, but anyone else's cell therapies. So once again, to finish off where we started, we've got, um, you know, our the pedigree of our technologies, there's a real sleep at night factor with the science from the, the from the from Yale, from Penn, from Oxford, from the people who invented this field in some instances. That's who we license from and that's who we work with. We've got adequate cash, lots of shots on goal for value creation and and um, you know, risk diversification. Uh, two therapies in the clinic right now, two cell therapy platforms uh, with both internal and external opportunities and lots of news flow. So um, a lot of ground, um, appreciate your attention and happy to take your questions. Excellent, thanks very much, Stephen. Great breakdown of, of Prescient. And if there's anyone here in the webinar that wasn't sure of the company, they definitely definitely have a good idea now. Um, yeah, there's a question here, obviously there's a lot of pillars um, with Prescient. What project at the moment is showing the most potential uh, for the next five to 10 years, a bit longer term? Oh, goodness me. Well, the good thing is you get a piece of pie today and a piece of pie down the track. Um, I guess I can answer that in two ways without being evasive. I'm trying to give the most fulsome answer I can. PTX 100, without a doubt, is the most mature. So that's the lowest risk one. And it just so happens that the most mature asset is actually showing the most promise right now in these areas of unmet needs. So. I mean, if everything goes to plan, and let's just take a cold shower here, I don't want to get too excited. If everything goes to plan, in the time frame that you're speaking of, that drug could be earning substantial revenues. That could be on the market if it gets approved. Um, and because the drug development, that accelerated approval really truncates that, um, that right down. So what would normally still be in clinical trials would be in the market a few years in. So that would be good. What has the most potential? It's impossible to ignore this emerging field of cell therapy, just basically on the data. And I guess what I'm saying is with the shovels to the gold rush position, you know what, as an investor, I'd be very wary of, as the whole field is emerging, trying to pick the winner, which one is it going to be? Um, you know, imagine again, trying to, as, as mobile phones first started out picking, is it is it the blueberry or the, what's it called? The blackberry, I've even forgotten what it's called. Is it the blackberry, is it the Nokia? Apple didn't even have a phone then. Is it, is it Motorola? Yeah, to, to try to pick a winner would be very different. What I'm saying is we own the network, okay? So as the whole field grows, we will grow with it. And these platforms will give, will give rise to technologies that will be, you know, we, we think best in class cell therapies. So I think to answer your question, PGX 100 here and now, but these cell therapies emerging and in that time frame will be, you know, will hopefully make a real dent as the whole field progresses. Yeah, good, good. And um, is, a, is there a substantial amount of effort to lower the cost of these therapies? Obviously the last one was, uh, well, one of the first ones was 500,000 for, for the year. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what, maybe what are some ways that you could attack, um, you know, the high barrier of entry? Yeah, so are you saying what can we do to bring the cost down for patients? Is that the question? Yep. Yeah, so in, well, with the targeted therapies, PGX100, you know, that's a pricing discussion we're looking at. Is it 
500 books to be a lot for a drug that doesn't work. I think it's easier to justify for payers higher drug prices where the drug works because the most expensive part of healthcare is when the drug doesn't work. Right? So the most expensive drugs are those that don't work. When the drug works, it actually ends up being very cost effective. Um, the cell therapies, cell therapies are hideously expensive as well, and the cost of goods is astronomical. So they cost between 350 and 500,000 US for a single bag of cells. You know that single bag that it's a one and done infusion at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but that's as expensive as it's going to get. Think of like organ transplants in the 70s versus now, for example, or you know, or any form of technology, personal computers in, in the 70s or 80s versus now. So it'll get better and better. It's happening now. It's driving down the cost. Cell Prime is going to have a big, um, as a manufacturing enhancement, have a big say in um, even moving that needle. But really, people are doing different types of cells. They're trying to make off-the-shelf cells, which you can be make at scale and when you can make them at scale instead of hand making them one by one by one like a bespoke suit it's not very cost effective people want to take a suit off the rack so all these other groups are developing these ways we're not cell therapy we're not cell developers we're letting all of these other people do the hard work because quite frankly we couldn't care if it's the patient's own cell or if it's off the shelf or if it's even uh, you know, all these other approaches to drive down the cost of these funky cells, we can modularize anything. The magic is in the modularity, and if they you want know, about modular, then you've got to you've got to have a chat to us about RT. So, as the cost comes down through the efforts of others, mm. uh, we will seek the benefit of that because the magic is in the modularity. Yeah, good, and and I take um, maybe with the release of more fast-paced drug trials for other companies. Um, I'd take that would also lower maybe the cost of it as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, maybe on that again, um, with, you know, with a lot of recent advances, you said the example of, of transplants, you know, 50 years ago to now, um, where would you see the oncology space kind of changing in the next 50 years? Oh my goodness. That's a very exciting question because you know what, more progress has been made in the last five to 10 years than in the last 150 years. It's incredible. So the, the three pillars of cancer therapy, cut it out since medieval times, zap it with radiation. They're getting better at that, at targeting that, but zap it with radiation and poison it with chemo and hope that the good cells live and the bad cells die. It's poison, right? And this new area of harnessing your immune system is a whole new ball game. Nothing is more efficient in getting rid of a foreign invader from your body than your own immune system. All we need to do is to focus it on what to look for, and that's what we're now able to do. So what we're seeing now is just the start. So I guess to answer your question, um, I don't think we can declare the war on cancer, which was actually, yeah, that was a, a 1970s campaign, that, that the war on cancer, and the trillions of dollars that have gone into cancer development. Uh, cancer therapy development. I think it's too early to call it one. Uh, I wouldn't say we have seen the end of cancer, but I think we are seeing in our lifetimes the beginning of the end of cancer, which is an incredibly exciting thing. And where it can't be conquered, I'm very confident it can be controlled and people can live with maybe slower growing malignancies with all of these impressive tools, just like it was like it was diabetes. So again, we're seeing with the very first iteration with the clunkiest possible CAR T, we're seeing cures in certain cancers. How do we bring that to more cancers? And that field is just doing that. So I'm incredibly optimistic about cancer treatments in our lifetimes. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for today. Is there any last words you maybe want to leave investors with? Um, no, other than that, um, we, you know, you buy straw hats in winter. I know the biotech sector has been knocked about a fair bit and, um, and prescient with it, but I can tell you that the assets are progressing really, really well. You, you've seen the three pillars of the business. You've seen the real data. It's just about the data at the end of the day. The data is unfolding better than we've expected. And in areas of unmet need, we've got this, you know, um, lovely vote of confidence there by the FDA with their um, with their orphan drug designation beyond what we expected, and we've got these emerging things there. So um, a very good um, a very good bet, and we're we're well funded. So yeah, 
CODA's PTX and um, look forward to welcoming new shareholders to the journey. So, yeah, thanks Perfect. for having me. Yeah, perfect. We're just, just wrapping things up. Thanks very much, Steve, and, um, for your time today and everyone else in attendance. Um, this has been another webinar from Port Jackson Securities. Hope to see you all the next one. Take care.